welcome to Brain Talk, everyone. Now let's talk dog brains. Dr. Angie Johnston is here from Boston College to tell us about how smart your dog really is. Dr. Johnston, will you get us started? Yes. So actually, the research that I do is in a field that's known as comparative cognition. And so in comparative cognition, what we do is we compare across different animal species to try to figure out what aspects of our psychology are shared with other animals and what aspects might be unique to humans. And so what we try to do is by identifying which traits are shared and which are unique, we can understand how have these traits evolved. And a lot of people study actually chimpanzees to answer this question because they're our closest relatives. But I like to study dogs because dogs over domestication have actually become more similar to us in some ways than our own closest primate relatives. So for instance, even four week old puppies are able to use human pointing to figure out where a treat is, which is something that our primate relatives need hundreds and hundreds of trials to be taught how to do. So puppies seem to have already been domesticated to be our social partners. And um, there's a lot of other examples I could give of the way that dogs are similar to us, but some of the work that I've done is looking to see what are maybe some ways that dogs might actually, um, quote unquote, outsmart um, human children. And, and of course, we only see them outsmarting them in the context of the experiment. I'll circle back and explain how what humans do may even be a little bit smarter when you think about it in a big picture. But we have these puzzles where there's a really simple solution to the puzzle. And when you give the puzzles to children, they're able to figure this out really quickly. But if you show children some unnecessary steps before they um, come to the puzzle, the children will copy these steps. And this is what we call over imitation because children are copying too many steps. They're not just doing the easy solution that gets you to the goal. And so what people have done is they've looked and see, do chimpanzees do this as well? And chimpanzees don't. Um, they just go straight to the easy solution and they skip all that silly stuff that was demonstrated. And um, we've looked with dogs as well. And we found that dogs also seem to quote unquote outsmart the human children because they just do the simple solution too. But one thing that we've thought is perhaps this over imitation with children is actually really important for supporting our human culture. Because if you think about it, there's all sorts of things children need to learn, like to wash their hands and brush their teeth and things that we have that are cultural tools and technologies like building a fire that you need to do all of these seemingly unnecessary steps. And so a lot of my work looks at this comparison between children and dogs. We also look between dogs and dingoes. And I want to mention people actually, they have this um, idea that dingoes are ferocious, but they're actually quite sweet. If I had known, I would have come prepared with some of my very cute picture slides of the dingoes cuddling with me um, when we go to this sanctuary in Australia that's called the Dingo Discovery Research San Sanctuary. And the dingoes are really exciting because they give us this interesting snapshot into domestication. So what we think happened in domestication is that around 50,000 years ago, there were um, these animals that were very wolf-like that lived in packs in Asia. And then they um, started to become into human camps because the human camps had trash that was very enticing. And this is a process that we call self-domestication where the animals were um, more tame because they're coming into human camps and then their babies are more likely to be tame. And then these tame animals were taken by humans and bred to be um, more social with humans and more um, you know, interactive with humans. And what we think happened is these animals that were self-domesticated but not yet artificially selected, went on boats with seafarers to Australia and went back into the wild. And then they're the dingoes we know today. 
So they haven't been artificially selected the same way that our pet dogs have been. So that's the difference between the dingoes and the dogs is the dingoes are tame, but they're not actually domesticated. And so that's what we can start to really see how these two pieces of domestication shape traits in dogs. Um, so yeah, that, that's really interesting. I didn't realize, I, I assumed also like Pablo that the dingoes were a little bit more sort of like these aggressive animals. So that's, that's really interesting to hear. Um, are they on par with dogs in terms of, of their cognitive sort of abilities? So it's really interesting. The, um, some of their social motivations to interact with humans, like following pointing, they're not quite as good as dogs at following pointing, but they are better than wolves mm -hmm. and they're better than chimpanzees. And um, one thing that's especially fascinating is their tendency to make eye contact, um, which is our really, that that's a huge connection between humans and dogs is this eye contact. Right. The dingoes don't make as much eye contact mm -hmm. as the dogs do, but they make more eye contact than wolves do. Um, but we have some research that suggests the dingoes actually are more clever than the dogs. Huh. Um, they're really great puzzle solvers. Um, we put puzzles in front of them. The, the dingoes just, there's not a puzzle. The dingoes have met that they can't solve. But the dogs, poor things, um, they tend to give up and look back at their owner and say, can you please help me? Oh. So I, I wonder about the, the pointing aspect, right? Because, um, you know, we, we've all had dogs at some point and, and dogs, like you said, are really good at kind of intuitively knowing what we're trying to tell them, whether it's with words or the tone of our voice or like the gestures that we make, right? Um, and when we point at something, amazingly, dogs will look at what we're pointing at, right? Um, so the fact that they can do that and dingoes can't, is that because they've been with us for so long, these dogs that they have started to almost take on these, or not take on, but um, understand human traits more so than the other species that haven't been domesticated. Yes, I think so. I think that what's happened is we've actually shaped these traits into them through artificial selection. So we basically take dogs that were better at this trait, breed them together, mm -hmm. and then keep going on and on like that. One thing that's really fascinating is, um, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet, but looking at breed differences is something that's really exciting as well, since some breeds have been more, um, you know, selected for certain traits and others, but we're still in the process of figuring out um, some of those breed differences. What about the uh, emotions? I mean, I, uh, I've had dogs and, and, and it varies with, with dogs. I mean, I've had dogs that are completely and absolutely in tune to your emotions, you know, when you're happy, when you're sad. Um, I had a horrible accident many years ago and um, um, my, obviously my dog didn't know that uh, and I was in the hospital and, and the dog was just in absolute depression. Um, and, um, you know, my, my wife kept telling me that, you know, your dog is, is really very depressed because you're not um, you're not around he does he know that you're sick <laughs> so how about the emotions and how they can you know detect emotions from their owners oh it's incredible there's all different ways people have tried to look and see do dogs recognize emotion they do it just based off of facial expression so they'll show dogs like pieces of face even just the eyes or the mouth and the dogs will be able to tell happy versus angry yeah. um they can tell it um, when people are acting it out or when people are actually sad. There's just all sorts of research that shows that time and time again, dogs are amazing at reading our emotions. It's truly incredible. And because there's two aspects to that, right? So one aspect that he said is they can identify that I'm sad. But then the second portion of that is they're sad because I'm sad. So then we're going into the empathy sort of theory of mind kind of arena, right? Yeah, exactly. And I definitely think that there's the, the question about empathy is one that's a bit trickier to test, but there's definitely been some work that suggests that dogs can kind of catch their owner's emotions. Um, mm. That that's definitely been something that's been shown. And so whether they have that cognitive empathy or not, that's a, you know, so there's like the more emotional empathy and then there's more the cognitive empathy. Mm -hmm. I think that the cognitive empathy piece is one that's a little bit harder to know. Are they really understanding um, right. that? Right. Or are they just sad because since you're not well, you're not cuddling them or petting them or mm -hmm. feeding them as much yeah. as you used to. Is that why they're depressed? Not because of you, right? That's a right. Exactly. 
Mm-hmm. Although they identify uh, threats, uh, sometimes even before I do, uh, you know, out on out on the field or or you know, looking at a person, um, they sometimes feel threatened um, if I show any kind of um, uh, of nervousness. Yeah, there's this really cool study that was looking at something called social referencing, where dogs will be in an ambiguous situation and then they'll look back to their owner to try to figure out what is my owner feeling? What does that mean? What should I be feeling? Um, They do this, by the way, with a a fan that has ribbons on it to make it just a little bit scary and uncertain, but not too scary and uncertain. That's funny. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of like kids, right? I mean, kids will, will look to you if something happens you know, someone runs in the street and screams or whatever, and my kids will kind of look at me. And if I'm like, yeah, seems about yeah, exactly. right. And they'll just it's, kind of carry on. But if exactly. I'm like, what is happening? You know? So, yeah. so you did mention at the beginning that you were comparing dogs and kids, right? So like a fully grown dog who's pretty smart and can do things like at what level, like <laughs> you compare them to a three-year-old to a four-year-old, like where, where do we stand? Yeah. We usually compare them to three to six-year-olds, depending sort of on the study. And it's a really interesting question because we, it is tricky since we do use the adult dogs, but um, puppies are so hard to come by because they're only puppies for such a short period of time. Um, But that is definitely like a cool future direction would be to compare more to the puppies that are the matched age to the preschoolers. But I don't think that we can say that there's like dogs are X age. because there's so many different capacities that dogs have and to compare those to children. Sometimes we see dogs performing feats that um, infants can perform and that's really cool because there are things that are so innate for infants that we see being innate for dogs. But sometimes we see dogs um, performing more like preschool children. Right. Yeah, I I mean, it, it going back, I'm a neuroscientist, right? So I always think of the brain, like what's happening in the brain. And if you compare the brain of a three-year-old to the brain of a fully grown dog, you're probably sort of, um, you know, in in the same ballpark in terms of like cortical development, Mm -hmm. right? So for babies, of course, they have a cortex and they, so the cortex of the air of your brain, that the prefrontal cortex that allows you to make decisions and, you know, executive functioning and solving problems. Um, And for the baby's brain, it's not um, fully developed, shall we say, not fully myelinated. The axons are, are kind of immature still. And so I wonder how does that compare then to the, to the fully adult canine brain? Yeah, I'm not sure. There's been different research that has compared adult humans to adult dogs, like um, looking at reward centers and things like that. Um, But I don't know of any that's been comparing children Mm -hmm. to adult dogs. Or, or any dogs. Mm-hmm. But, but they do have a prefrontal cortex, right? They do have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to what we were talking about um, with the, do- uh, the dogs being able to determine what's going on with the owner. Are you able to tease apart? So if I, the, just the facial part of it, like, you know, being sad versus, or like the tone, because there's a lot of things in play, right? The way that the owner looks, at something or acts when they see something, the tone of voice, their you know body language. Are you able to tease out those kind of things and when one comes into play versus the other, or is it a combination of the three things? Yeah, I think that there's definitely evidence that they can tell from the facial expression itself. Um, so there's definitely. Um, research where they use this touch screen and they train the dogs to go touch a happy face or touch an angry face. And they'll even just do like the eyes or the mouth and the dogs are able to touch happy versus angry. So I know that they can do facial expressions. Um, With respect to the other pieces, they haven't looked as much at that though. There has been um, studies that have looked like audios of crying um, or laughter and try to see the dog's cortisol reaction to that. Um, But I don't remember off the top of my head the results of that study. So uh, this is really interesting to me, right? Because you're talking about, you know, dogs 
recognizing emotion in people's faces, right? So obviously they have facial recognition. And that's, you know, in humans, it's a part of the brain called the fusiform face area, which allows humans to recognize, hey, there's a human face and this is a face that I recognize. So dogs have a similar area to that. But so then why can't they see me on FaceTime? Why can't they see me over Zoom? Big that's question. a really good question. Yeah, we <laughs> We've actually been doing Zoom studies with dogs, um, cool. but we don't do it like we do it where we tell the owner what to do with the dog and we record it. The dogs have no idea that we're there. It's so funny. They just really have no idea that someone's there. I don't know how you would think that they can, if they can do a touchscreen study, they should be able to tell on FaceTime. Right. I don't like, know. Obviously, they're, they're more inclined to identify someone by scent. I get that, right? Mm -hmm. But they can also identify faces, is what you're telling me. So, yes. like, why do they suck at Zoom? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Someone should really study that. Someone should really study that. Absolutely. Um, all right, we have a uh, couple of questions from the Q&A. Um, so, one of them, one person wants to know, what exactly are the types of puzzles that you're setting up to test the dogs? Ah, yes. So we try to keep the puzzles as simple as we can. Our most complex puzzle we've used is a puzzle that takes three steps where it has a platform at the top that there's a lever that you push the tree down a slide. Then at the end of the slide, it comes to a gate that you pull open with a rope and then it comes under a cover that you flip open. That's the one that the dingoes do great at. And then the dogs just, the, the people that bring their dogs and with their families, they looked at us, at the, they came in for two days to do this with their dog. The dogs don't figure it out even after two days. And the, the people come up to us and they're like, why did you waste our time having us bring our dogs in? Don't you know there's no way the dogs can solve this puzzle? And then we show them the videos of the dingoes and they're like, wow that's a huge difference. And so that's um, some of the puzzles we do. They're custom designed. Um, we make them with a uh, acrylic, clear acrylic and glue the pieces together. You know what's going to happen? Everyone's going to get off this call and go and make their own. <laughs> like my dog can do it. I don't know about those other study dogs. <laughs> what was that to me? Sorry. No, I was saying that you said there's a treat involved. Does it matter what the treat is? Like oh. if it's something that is more enticing to the dogs and they work hard for it. <laughs> we, we do, we make, so we found this, like these treats that the dogs really like pretty universally. I guess I won't say what they are because that might be advertising and I don't <laughs> want to do that. Um, but there's a special treat that we use that the dogs really like. So we try to make it as exciting as we possibly can. And sometimes dogs even bring in their own favorite treats. Like we've got some dogs that like cheese or hot dogs, or we have one dog whose Bacon favorite bits. treats is carrots. <laughs> oh, carrots. <laughs> sweet. So uh, a lot of the questions, uh, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to kind of combine them that have to do with the types of dogs, right? So um, in terms of the breeds that you're using, um, do they have the same lifespan? Is it the same sort of range of ages and abilities? Is there a difference between dogs that were raised um, with a lot of other dogs together oh, or dogs that are question. only raised around humans? A lot of questions sort of like relating to, to the background of the dogs. That's all really, so those are all really exciting questions. It'd be really exciting to look at all of those different factors. We just have any dogs can come in of any age or breed or sex. Um, the only thing is they have to have had their rabies vaccinations. And so that means they have to be older than a certain age to have had their full set of rabies vaccinations. Um, but that's it. Um, other than that, as any, any dogs can come in, they also can't be uh, aggressive um, to people, of course. Um, but we have dogs of all types. We haven't um, been able to look at differences because I like those, because we'd need a really, really big sample size. So unfortunately with my work, I'm not sure, but other people have started looking at breed differences and we sometimes see them, but there's nothing that's like a consistent thing I can say, except there's this one group of dogs. And if anyone on this call has these dogs, they're going to know what I'm talking about. There are these ancient breeds. So dogs like Sharpays, Shiba Inus, um, Basenjis, um, Malamutes, these dogs that often have this um, reputation for having a very independent streak. Um, they might be escape artists. They might um, be known for destroying things in the house. Um, so we see these ancient breeds looking a lot more wolf-like um, in their behavior kind of across the board. 
I had a Malamute and it destroyed my apartment. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, could never, could never house train him. Never. No. It didn't matter what I did. He could not house train him. He wanted to go in one spot, and that's where we're going to go. And it doesn't matter how much you punished him or reward him. It was amazing. I know people like that. <laughs> it, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting like what you're saying i i, I imagine that if you were to expand on some of the studies as to like dogs that have owners that really you know have them do puzzles mm -hmm, as they grow mm -hmm, up like mm -hmm. have you know mm -hmm, are they going to perform right. better like that yeah, environment right. you know that environment also plays a role in you know uh, hugely and one of the biggest factors on puzzle performance in other people's studies um is training level so mm -hmm. definitely right. that training can make a difference. Huh, interesting. So there's also questions of, I just wanna, we've got about three minutes left and I wanna make sure that we get uh, to many of the questions. So there's a question about the ability of dogs to recognize themselves in a the mirror. So oh gosh, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> oh man, that one's, it's not been really fully determined yet. So I don't have an answer for you on that one. There was one study that looked at dogs odor recognition of themselves, mm -hmm. and it seemed like they do recognize their own odors. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the jury's still out on the mirror self recognition. And, and is that uh, breed dependent? Or is it just like, how the study was carried out? Um, I think it's just that we don't have enough research to really support it yet. Okay. Okay. But is there some indication that it that there might be some dogs that can do it and some dogs that can't? There might be. Okay, all right. Um, and there's also a question, and this is, I think, maybe a clarification uh, that we can make. Uh, so one person says, are you saying, based on what we know from dog neuroscience, that dogs experience emotion solely based on what they perceive from other people, uh, whether it's by visual or facial, and that a dog's experience does not summon up its own emotional response to that situation? So I'll let you Oh, <laughs> gosh, no, that's yeah. a great clarification question. Definitely dogs have their own emotional reaction to things as well, just like humans do, but sometimes as humans, just as for dogs, our emotional reactions are connected to other people's emotional reactions as well. Right, right, right. Um, there's another question, sort of similar question, you know, do dogs have, have fears? I think dogs definitely have fears, um, for sure. And some dogs even have phobias. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. And there's a whole, there's a whole um, field sort of of neuropsychiatric illness in dogs as well, right? So dogs can can become depressed, dogs can um, have OCD, they can have bipolar disorder, and they do respond to treatments similar mm. to adults wow. responding to those treatments. Yeah, and in fact, for some um, of these psychiatric um, disorders, including especially OCD, dogs have been used as model species for trying to mm. track down um, sort of the genetic underpinnings of these. Mm -hmm. I love it when they dream, uh, yeah, you know, so, awesome. you know, my dogs dream, you know, they, they growl or bark or sh shake their tail or, or get their hackles up. And I'm like, look at this one, you know, what, what is he, what is he dreaming about? <laughs> yeah, that one's one I wish we could study. That one's one that may never, <laughs> that may be one that's not possible. To yeah. Study, how do you study dreams? Yeah. 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 Well, we can't even do that in humans. So, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I guess the, the last question um, that maybe we can end with is, uh, do you think dogs can sense illness in their owners? Because I know this is, you know, some dogs are trained um, to be service dogs and they're specifically trained to smell for something or perceive something about an illness. Um, but in general, do you think that dogs can sense illness without being trained? I don't know of any research on that question. I think a lot of it's really been focused on what you're talking about with the trained dogs. And it's incredible that they can do this when they're trained. So I think that's a very good question. I think it's totally possible. I just don't uh, think we have research on it yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I lied. One more question. Yeah. Why we do have, some well, dogs watch television? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's true, and some do it, and some don't, and it's so interesting. I I don't know why. I guess it's like, why do some people watch more television than other people? I guess we'll never know. But then why don't they watch me when I'm on FaceTime? I don't get it. I it doesn't make, it doesn't any, make sense. any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I put Animal Planet when I'm when I'm out of the house, you know, so they oh, can. That's oh, nice. that's nice. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> 
All right. Well, let's wrap that up. Thank you so much, Angie, for being with us. Um, there are a couple of more questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, um, but that goes to show how interested people are. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.